Hello! If you like my videos and want more, or have been wondering where I've been for the last couple months, check out Hiding in Private. It's my other channel. I'm doing mostly non-anime things, talking about video games, cartoons, or whatever else strikes my fancy. I've got a 14-hour Persona 4 analysis, 6 hours on Mr. Universe, an hour-long video on Sekiro, and a few others on FromSoft games, and many more videos to come. But for now, live-action One Piece, huh? It's kind of wild. I have my positive and negative thoughts, and we'll get into those, but up front, honestly, I liked it. I had a lot more fun with it than I've had with any other anime live action, and I feel like it did the best job I've seen of encapsulating an anime in live action, which is weird because One Piece is like designed to be animated more than nearly any other anime series out there. Like, Luffy's power is literally a rubber hose, the classic form of animation. But yeah, let's get into it. Honestly, a lot of the effects were very charming. They felt very camp, but very well done. It reminds me of the live-action adaptations made in Japan for a lot of series, like Death Note. But at the same time, they clearly had way more money and way more time put into the effects. And that didn't just stop with the CG, but also with the practical effects and the set designs. Oh my god, the Barassier looked fantastic. Kaya's house looked brilliantly extravagant, filled with things, and the tangerine field that Nami runs through? They're all great! The usage of the original One Piece score was also subtle and satisfying. The way that they play the Bink Sake instrumental in the background when young Luffy is on Shanks' ship, and how the instrumental of the original One Piece opening plays only once they sail off on the Going Merry for the first time. Really nice, subtle touches. I mean, I guess the One Piece opening plays another time, but that's a really good choice for the first time. Classic themes from the anime also have remixed appearances, especially in the Luffy vs. Arlong fight. A lot of the same motifs are clearly being used, but they're not just ripping the soundtrack that we've heard in the anime for the last 85 years. It honestly just felt very intentional. Another thing I have to congratulate is the pacing. Genuinely, the way that Episode 1 weaves all of the intro stuff with Romance Dawn and Zoro and Nami, and it's so well-paced and charming. And the changes to Kobe throughout the whole eight episodes, personally, and his more clear presence in the story, for me, was much appreciated. Like, they even took a lot of creative liberties, but all of the story or plot-based ones seem to avoid any important things and only play with necessary but not necessarily specific details. Something else I liked, one Piece is weird. It's an alternate world, and there's a lot of weird crap all over the place. And most media these days, especially live action, especially in America, if it does something weird, they have to scream in your face about how self-aware they are about it. Not with live action One Piece, and thank God for that. When Garp shows up in his dog hat, we didn't get a stupid quip like, Okay, buddy, <laughs> what are you wearing? <laughs> or, Oh, look who the dog dragged in! That stupid, insecure Marvel movie quippery that seems to poison every big budget nowadays. It's not in the show. At all. Not a single, stupid, insecure, stroking for the audience moment. Something that I think unfortunately was many of the things that sort of over-encumbered the problems with many other live actions, like the Netflix Death Note and Cowboy Bebop. All in all, it really didn't feel like they made any compromises on the silliness. They just played it straight like it was normal, and that was perfect. When Garp wrecks his office while making vague dog sounds, or Luffy screaming at the sky, it would be cringe if it wasn't so self-confident and fun. So yeah, like camp. For the first time in my life, I actually want to see a follow-up to a live-action anime. I want Alabasta. Give me Robin, please. I also liked uh, that there was some craft put into each shot. Like, I've never truly felt the talent of Sanji's cooking like I did watching the satisfying moments they show of him doing just that. They get in real close and personal and show all the steps. The outfits are also amazing, like the manga and anime are jumping off the screen. Like, they make them fit as normal outfits that don't look super out there for the most part, but they don't compromise on the designs either, really showing how good the costume design is in One Piece in general. And personally, of course, I want the nautical blue and white uh, button-up that Sanji has, even more than I did before. Okay, okay, okay. Let's talk some negatives, though. Brass tacks. And one of them is, while the effects straddle the line between impressive and camp, 
Sometimes they do end up looking a bit too amateurish, in my opinion. Specifically, the lighting on young Sanji on the uh, green screened rock in the one scene whenever they're like starving to death or whatever. The lighting doesn't mesh well, and it's obvious that it's being edited in post. It looked bad. I'm not going to show it. Arlong also looked really goofy in brighter lighting, especially in the background of certain scenes where he wasn't the focus, but like if you looked at him and he was kind of blurry, you could like tell that he looked more goobery than he should. But these are largely minor to me. I think the biggest issue I had personally was the whitewashing of the character's morality. Now don't get me wrong, Luffy is a good guy, but he isn't like a good guy, right? Like. He has no qualms about killing people, he's not overly concerned about innocent people that he doesn't know getting hurt, and he generally works for reward, even if that reward is a truckload of food. Same goes for the rest of the Straw Hats. They are dysfunctional and all have their own moral failings, but it's just how people are, and it kind of lends into them being pirates, even though they are good people. They are far more interesting for that fact but a lot of the things that make the characters more morally ambiguous or could maybe cause parts of the audience to go against them are completely left out of this adaptation, like almost entirely. The biggest of which for me was with Nami, who is given multiple extra scenes showing her inner conflict and uncertainty and eventually abandoning her crew, while in the source material, she basically just disappears when nobody's looking during the Dong Krieg and Arlong stuff. It feels like a much more significant betrayal to the Straw Hats in the anime and manga, and you really see Zoro's side to it a lot more. Him saying she made her choice. One of my favorite moments with Luffy is also changed. In the manga and anime, when being offered to hear Nami's backstory, he straight up doesn't care, and he leaves to go off on his own. At one point, he falls asleep. This says so much about the simplicity of Luffy as a character that I think makes him far more interesting, ironically, than in the live action, where he's extremely serious. Another thing is when Nami does rejoin, they totally skip the scene where she robs her home village on her way out. This was played lightheartedly in the manga and anime, of course, but it does end up giving Nami a lot less agency in general in the live action. On one hand, she comes across as a more capable fighter, but narratively speaking, she is played as the victim a lot, which the original Nami would never bear to see herself as, except in a most critical, vulnerable moment, being the iconic hat scene. There are a lot of these small changes, but I think that they probably did it on purpose, as they really pile up to sort of making a more appealing cast to the general populace, which sort of smoothens the bumps that make these characters who they really are. It grants it for a wider appeal, but it gets rid of some of the more interesting parts of it. It was probably my least favorite part of the live action. Because while Luffy is never someone who would let someone hurt his Nakama, he's not really all that much of a power of friendship guy either. He's carefree, he has fun, he loves fighting for the sake of fighting. His having fun nature is part of what makes him unique, and generally he feels a bit too serious at times in this live action. Like, whenever he's grabbing the claws of the little kitty man, instead of having a fun-loving smile, he has a borderline evil look on his face. Not to say that the comedy is gone, though. The whole cast does get a chance to sneak in small quips that had me laughing throughout, specifically one with Usopp and Barashie. Honestly, if it's not too slanderous to say, I think I was able to appreciate the story of One Piece from a whole different angle. Despite some of my personal gripes, the heavily improved pacing compared to the anime made everything just congeal into a more engaging experience for me. That said, I saw a post by Grand Line Review, and you know, obviously they have a much better pulse on what One Piece fans' opinions are. It seems like, based on their stuff, that some fans are upset about the changes to increase Garp and Kobe's presence through season one. And honestly, I disagree. I liked it. I love Kobe in general and wish he had more presence in the original series. And what they added didn't really mess with continuity at all. It just gave more context and characterization between Kobe leaving Luffy and starting his training under Garp and then meeting him again in Water 7. I also really liked how much more we got to see of Garp as both a proud grandfather and a proud marine, and the conflict between that is so fun. His anger at his grandson for choosing to be a pirate and his pride in his grandson's capability, resilience, and spirit were such 
fun, conflicting parts of him in the manga, and getting it highlighted even more here was a joy for me to see personally. It's also clear that it came from a place of concern, as one who saw Gold Roger die, he doesn't want to see his grandson reach the same fate. Honestly, a really enjoyable change for me. I loved Garp, I loved Kobe and all of their stuff, every minute of it. I even like Helmeppo way more than I do in the original series because of this. In my mind, these are the sorts of adaptation flares that we should revel in. They don't replace the source material, but they expand or adjust context for things of how we would see the world in ways that are largely inconsequential to actual world building and continuity. Anyways, sorry, it's been so long since I posted here. Honestly, I mentioned a couple times how times were getting rough and money was really tight, and I honestly had to basically give up and buckle down for a bit and do what I could to make buy. Truth is, Japanese companies still operate on the copyright understanding of a drunk brain damaged surf from the 1400s. In fact, I currently have a copyright strike on my channel for a video I already fought the company off for, for copyright, three years ago. As for the video removed by YouTube, I'll still have it available on Patreon, of course, but it sucks. It's gonna suppress hiding in public as a channel a ton. But you know, it's just tiring. Every time I spend tons of creative time and energy on videos, the patron support, which I do appreciate a ton, and the AdSense just weren't enough to justify the total amount of hours I put in. When I was making enough money to support myself proper, when I was getting a lot of fan donations on Twitch, that mostly dried up. Now, if money was no problem, obviously this would not be an issue, but I do live in the real world, and I have to do what I can to survive, not to say that I'm not doing what I love. I've just shifted into doing content I love that has better all-around rewards. My second channel made more money in August than I have ever made on Hiding in Public, even at its peak month. And not even by a little bit, by over double of the peak. That's how little money I've been making on Hiding in Public this whole time, and how reliant I have been on donations. Not to say that it was an ungodly amount of money still, but it seems clear to me that if I want to keep pursuing my passions and making what I love, anime content might have to be on the back burner for a bit. Seriously though, I actually love the stuff that I'm making on Hiding in Private, even more if I'm honest, it's just fun. I'm able to finally be myself and be free. I, for some reason, feel so much more comfortable, probably because it's a smaller core audience, but for the first time in years, I'm feeling a community passion for my work again seeing people really resonate and care about what I'm doing, and that means so much for my own personal sense of self. So yeah, sorry for not posting for a while, but if you haven't been watching Hiding in Private, you probably have like 30 hours worth of some of my best content to catch up on now. Thank you for watching, and uh, see ya! Thanks Daniel Frowsing, Zioma, Benny, and all my other patrons. Ko-Fi, and Super Chat supporters, if you'd like to support me, check out the description. This seems apt for the One Piece live-action focus and re-watching East Blue, but I will never give up on my dreams. It's what makes me alive and human. Thank you.